Welcome back to the Sober Minded Podcast. I hope you enjoy this episode. I think it's a very interesting one. I'm going to be going over the Beatitudes, but first I'm going to begin with an introduction to the Beatitudes. There's a very important concept that we have to discuss before we continue on studying the Beatitudes, because there's an important thing that a lot of people miss when uh, looking at the Beatitudes and trying to come up with what, uh, what Jesus is actually saying in this passage of Scripture. Before we get into that, though, one thing I want to get out of the way, I misspoke on the last episode. I said that these episodes will be going up on Tuesday. That's, that is wrong information. I record the episodes on Tuesday, but they actually go up on Wednesday. So just in case you were concerned about when the episodes are going up, they will be going up on Wednesday. I record them on Tuesday, upload them on Wednesday. So that's the day that you need to mark your calendars for the new Sober Minded episodes. So with that out of the way... Uh, really nothing else to say in terms of introduction, but we have to go to the introduction of the Beatitudes before we get into the actual Beatitudes. So I'm going to take this episode to spend time going over an important concept of the Beatitudes. And that concept is the concept of inversion or subversion. We can also call this the biblical inversion or the, the biblical paradoxes because there are very many paradoxes and inversions in scripture and basically what i'm referring to is this idea this concept or this phenomenon that we see a lot of times in scripture where god will take something that we're familiar with in the world and he'll invert it or subvert it and make it into something new or make it into a uh, something that he and make it into something new so now, already hearing that, that should bring to your mind, if you're familiar with scripture, that should bring to mind different uh, places where you see that. For example, one of the most major ones is um, Jesus Christ being described as a lamb, the lamb of God, and also Jesus Christ being described as a king. So we have that sort of contrasting points, those two contrasting points, lamb and king. You don't really think of a king as a lamb. You don't really think of a lamb as a king. So that is one example of the paradox. And there, there's a lot of them throughout all of Scripture. And this is just a way that God chose to communicate with his people, with all people, certain uh, truths, certain doctrines. And we have to accept that that's one of the ways that God chose to communicate with us. There are a lot of ways that God chose to communicate. That's one of the ways. And so we have to respect that uh, form of delivery. And we also have to make efforts to understand why he chose that method and how we can better understand that and apply it to our uh, Christian life, to our Christian walk. And it also is going to help us understand Christ's mission when he came to the earth. And also it's going to help us to understand the Beatitudes. So that's why it's important to cover this concept first before going into the Beatitudes, because a lot of people go into the Beatitudes with the wrong mindset. And so they come out with a lot of false ideas about what the Beatitudes means. And that can also affect other parts of our beliefs. So, it can also affect uh, our doctrines of Christ, what we believe about Christ, who he is and what he did. In order to begin, first first thing we have to do is we have to read this passage of scripture, the Beatitudes, even though I know we're all familiar with it. We have to read it to prep our minds to start this study. So, Sermon on the Mount, I'm using Bible Hub. I have the reader, uh, the reader version of it, starting with verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, he being Jesus. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And you can even continue on reading, and you'll see that the same concept is being carried out uh, through the rest of this passage here. But we're going to stick to the Beatitudes for now. And so one thing that we have to understand is this concept of subversion and inversion. 
to help us understand those words and what they mean, we'll be looking at the definitions here. And I have two sites that I'm going to use for the definitions here. The first one here is, of course, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which has the definition for subvert. They say to overturn or overthrow from the foundation. The second definition they give is to pervert or corrupt by an undermining of morals, allegiance, or faith. A subversion doesn't, it's not really used like that now. Uh, I think it's more used in a way of a sort of like a bait and switch kind of thing. You're expecting one thing and at the last second, they switch it out for something else, something they didn't expect. That's sort of how it's used now. But I think this definition still applies to uh, a lot of cases, especially what we see now in the media and in movies. There's a lot of subversion going on where they sort of bait and switch you, but it also, they're trying to overturn and overthrow uh, the foundation. Now, that applies in a lot of different ways. Maybe they're trying to overthrow, overturn, and overthrow the Christian influence in the world. I think that's one way that we can apply that word uh, to today's, you know, the way we see subversion play out today, such as in movies and things like that. You have a lot of, uh, a lot of traditional values being subverted in movies. You have masculinity being uh, made fun of, being mocked, and femininity, femininity being placed on a pedestal. So that's another subversion. And really, it's a subversion of what God has created. That's the kind of subversion we see nowadays. Uh, basically, all throughout history, there's been a lot of efforts to subvert Christian traditions, Christian values, traditional values, things like that. And even uh, Western ideals, that's sort of where it's being uh, applied also. So any time you see a mockery of the West or a mockery of Christianity, what you're seeing is subversion. They're trying to subvert. They're trying to show you something and you, you're expecting one thing. You're expecting something. You're expecting uh, maybe something that is in line with Western and traditional values, but they actually turn it on its head. So it, it becomes a mockery of it. And so they're just making fun of these traditional things. They're making fun of scripture. They're making fun of Christianity. They're making fun of Jesus, basically. A whole lot of different cases where that applies. I'm sure you've noticed a lot of those in the movies you've seen, TV shows, uh, the media, any sort of inter form of entertainment as well. There's a lot of subversion going on. And so I think that's one thing that a lot of people have picked up on, especially recently. Uh, we can even start you know, going into COVID, the pandemic, things like that. I think there's a lot of subversion going on there and uh you know riots things like that the blm riots basically anything revolving around those kinds of issues you're expecting one sort of thing but then they kind of pull the rug under you and they give you something else and the purpose of that is to overturn or overthrow some sort of set of values most of the time it's going to be christian values christian values or traditional values mass immigration open borders those kinds of things are also ways of subversion and the definition from the Webster's Dictionary gives us more insight on that meaning. And so the, the definition they give is to overthrow from the foundation, to overturn, to ruin utterly. And here they give an example. The northern nations of Europe subverted the Roman Empire. He is the worst enemy of man. This is a separate, uh, this is a separate definition here or a separate example. He is the worst enemy of man who endeavors to subvert the Christian religion. The elevation of corrupt men to office will slowly but surely subvert a Republican government. Now, using the word Republican, not in the same sense of, you know, right and left, Republican, Democrat, Republican as in terms of a republic, a someone who's in a, someone who's in an official and a republic government. You call them a Republican because they're representative and a republic. So uh, three examples there of that word being used. And what it means and so there we can sort of gather more information about what this word means and sort of reinforce uh, reinforcing the things we believe about this word before so for example the things that i just got done talking about there's a lot of examples of subversion going on today and these are again three more examples fleshing out this idea of subversion pulling the rug under you and they they want to do they want to switch something in front of you it's like uh in indiana jones if you've ever seen those movies you have uh you know, Indiana Jones, he's about to grab the relic, but he has to switch it with something else. He goes to grab the relic. He grabs it at the last second. He switches it with something else to not set off the alarm, to not set off the traps. That's basically what we're seeing on a large scale all over the world. 
uh, and it's ramped up even more the past 10 years. So subversion. Now, the second word here is also invert or inversion. And the definition uh, that they give us here from the Mer Merriam-Webster, uh, to reverse imposition, order, or relationship. The second one, to turn inside out or upside down. The third one, to find the mathematical reciprocal of. Four, to reincorporate as a new entity in a foreign country to put a company through the process of inversion. That's sort of an interesting uh, definition there, but that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, what the first two definitions here are talking about, to reverse in position, order, or relationship, to turn inside out or upside down. So there's a kind of inversion that's very similar to subversion, where we see the same thing, uh, things being turned upside down and subverting our expectations, giving us something that we didn't expect. And so the same things can be applied to inversion here. We see Western values being inverted, Christian values, Christian virtues being inverted, being turned upside down and being made a mockery of. So very similar to subversion. There's a slight nuance there. Uh, it's not really necessary to go into that yet, but I think these are two words that are important to understand before we get into the Beatitudes. And lastly, the uh, definition definition from the Webster's Dictionary for invert. Uh, to turn into a contrary direction, to turn upside down, as to invert a cone, to invert a hollow vessel. To place in a contrary order or method, as to invert the rules of justice, to invert the order of words. Uh, in music, to change the orders of notes which form a chord or the parts which compose harmony, to divert, to turn into another channel, to embezzle. The last two definitions aren't really the ones we're going to be working from, but the first two definitely uh, apply in this case. So, subversion, inversion. Now, the reason why it's important to notice that, to uh, recognize, to understand these two definitions is because uh, firstly, we need to understand what we're seeing from the world. Secondly, we need to understand that this is a a uh, method of communication that God has chosen to deliver his word to his people in. So he's using subversion and inversion all throughout scripture. It's used in the world. It's used in scripture. There's two different approaches that are being made. Obviously, God doesn't work the same way that the world does. And so they, there might be similar methods, but... The world is inverting the inversion that God is using in Scripture. Where the world inverts what God says, God inverts what the world says. And so that's where we see subversion and inversion. The world and God, or Scripture and the world, are inverting and subverting each other. And so we need to realize that that's kind of what's been going on in the world since uh, the dawn of man, we can say. Since the beginning of time, the world has been contrary to God, and they both have different forms of subversion and inversion. So in Scripture, the way this plays out at the beginning of the episode, I gave an example. Jesus is described as a lamb. He's described as a king. Those are sort of two contradictory ideas. Also, you would expect a king to rule uh, extravagantly and to rule with authority, to rule you know, with his armies behind him. And then when we see Jesus enter into Jerusalem, he's riding on a donkey. There's a subversion of expectations that God is using. Now, the reason God uses those subversions and inversions is to demonstrate that God is in control of the outcome. No matter how, no matter how you add up the numbers, God can change the outcome. And that shows that God's in control, God is sovereign, and God has predestined the ends before the means were, were ever given. The means don't matter where God's power is uh, there where God's power is the, the the numbers don't need to add up God can make the numbers equal to whatever he wants basically and I hope you understand that's kind of a lot of words uh, used to explain that but I hope it makes sense and uh, so going further with that when we come to places in scripture like the Beatitudes we need to start with that mindset or else we're going to get into some trouble trying to figure out what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes because there is a lot of subversion you probably noticed that already a lot of subversion a lot of inversion and I don't want to get into the actual Beatitudes yet but we know the first one blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven so right away we have poor in spirit and we have kingdom of heaven those two ideas are contrasted because in our worldly thinking and our man-centered thinking 
when we hear poor in spirit, we don't think of somebody who's inheriting a kingdom. We think of someone who's poor. We think of someone who doesn't have anything, someone who's homeless, someone who's the furthest thing from uh, being royal or being welcomed into a kingdom. And so, uh, oh, much less the kingdom of heaven. Why would there be a poor person in the kingdom of heaven? You think there'd be something uh, more glorious, people more, you know, fit to dwell into the kingdom of heaven. But the term here is poor in spirit. A lot of people take that to mean some different things. Uh, I don't want to get too far into it, so I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to save that for the next episode, which I hope you also tune into. But again, going forward with this idea of subversion and in in inversion, I want to share with you some quotes from Matthew Henry's commentary. And so he says about the Beatitudes, he says, the circumstances of the sermon being accounted for, the sermon itself follows, the scope of which is, not to fill our heads with notions, but to guide and regulate our practice. So not to fill our heads with notions. That's the way a lot of people take the Beatitudes. They take it as notions, as quips, as little pithy statements. But they are, in fact, uh, ways to guide and regulate our practices, our actions. Uh, and I think more so our attitude towards life and towards uh, the various struggles that we endure in this life. I think the Beatitudes is, is the, the, the Beatitudes is trying to command us to live a certain way amidst all these uh, troubles and all these quarrels in life. But uh, Matthew Henry goes on. He proposes blessedness at the end. So that's the end of all the Beatitudes is blessedness. Uh, that's, that's the purpose. That's the, the end that the Beatitudes give us, blessedness. Matthew Henry continues and gives us the character of those who are entitled to blessedness, very different from the sentiments of a vain world, in eight Beatitudes, which may justly be called paradoxes. So paradox is kind of a synonym to subversion, inversion. It's not a synonym, but it's related to it in that a paradox is uh, something that shouldn't make sense, but that does uh, make sense. Two things that shouldn't work, but it does work. So for example, we can go back to the Beatitudes. Poor in spirit, kingdom of heaven, that's a paradox. Why would someone who's poor be in a kingdom? It's a paradox, but it works. Why? Because God says it does. Because Jesus says it does. Uh, remember what I said earlier? God makes the ends despite the means, despite it not making sense. God is sovereign and uh, predestined the outcome to be a certain way, no matter what tools he uses to get to that end. Now, here's a quote from John Calvin on uh, the Beatitudes as well. And this is sort of a longer one, but it's important to read all of this without interruption. So I'm just going to read it. Now, let us see in the first place why Christ spoke to his disciples about true happiness. We know that not only the great body of people, but even the learned themselves hold this error, that he is the happy man who is free from annoyance, attains all his wishes, and leads a joyful and easy life. At least it is the general opinion that happiness ought to be estimated from the present state. Christ, therefore, in order to accustom his own people to bear the cross, exposes this mistaken opinion that those are happy who lead an easy and prosperous life, according to the flesh. For it is impossible that men should mildly bend the neck to bear calamities and reproaches, so long as they think the patience is at variance with a happy life. The only consolation which mitigates and even sweetens the bitterness of the cross and of all afflictions is the conviction that we are happy in the midst of miseries, for our patience is blessed by the Lord and will soon be followed by a happy result. This doctrine, I acknowledge, is widely removed from the common opinion, but the disciples of Christ must learn the philosophy of placing their happiness beyond the world and above the affections of the flesh. Though carnal reason will never admit what is here taught by Christ, yet he does not bring forward anything imaginary. And I'll stop right there. So very good analysis by John Calvin there of what Jesus is doing when he's teaching the Beatitudes. And essentially, uh, to summarize Calvin's point, he says that Christ is disproving what the world thinks about happiness by giving ways that uh, seem unhappy unhappy practices and we'll just quickly look poor in spirit blessed are those who mourn blessed are those who meek 
Those aren't ways that you would normally think to attain happiness. The ways that the world says to obtain happiness is, uh, Calvin gives the example here, the happy man is one who is free from annoyances, so remove all annoying things in your life. Remove anything toxic from your life, something that you might have heard recently. Remove people out of your life that sort of ruin your mojo, ruin your vibe. That's kind of what's uh, being preached around these days. Also, one who is happy is one who attains all his wishes. Someone who gets everything they want. You want something, you go and get it. Now you're happy. If you're able to do that uninterrupted, that is what makes someone a happy person. That's what the world says. And who leads a joyful and easy life. No troubles, no worries. You get, you get everything you want. No one's uh, annoying. You surround yourself with people who just love you all the time and are happy to be around you. But really, that's a facade. It's fake. And so Christ is disproving that by saying the real way to happiness is to actually uh, be uncomfortable. To feel comfort for eternity in the future is to feel discomfort in the present for a short time. That's essentially what uh, Jesus is getting at. This is essentially, uh, Calvin's summary of the Beatitudes is that uh, God will bless you in the future. And even in the present life. But what you must do is you must carry that cross. You must bear the cross that Christ has called you to bear. And so in order to do that requires to feel discomfort. It requires you to be unhappy for a present moment. But even in doing that, there is a sense of satisfaction and joy that we derive from being unhappy. Because we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for Christ. We're doing it for God's glory. We're doing it because we were called to do that. And so that gives us a sense of satisfaction uh, because we are fulfilling our purpose. We're fulfilling the purpose which God has called us to fulfill. And so in that, despite it, there is discomfort, there is joy, there's satisfaction, knowing that we're doing the right thing. And we don't do it because uh, to get brownie points, to get extra credit, extra points. We do it because we are Christians. That's what we are called to do. And when God regenerates our spirits, when God regenerates our souls, when God regenerates our hearts by the Holy Spirit, that changes the things that we like, the things that we dislike, changes our affections, changes the things we hate. And so in that changing, we begin to admire and respect discomfort. We begin to look down upon comfort and pithy happiness. We begin to look forward to the day when God will bless us eternally with eternal life dwelling with him in the new heavens the new earth uh, dwelling in him in his presence and we start to think less of our present miseries and the present struggles we have in this life and so it is a paradox that although we are we are living in this life we don't look forward to the happiness in this life although we do uh, enjoy happiness in this life we enjoy being joyful we enjoy things that make us the things that lift our spirits Jesus Christ is certainly not calling us to live lives of sullenness or lives of misery but he is saying to don't expect the methods of the world to bring you complete and total satisfaction because it doesn't and in fact the world offers sinful ways to obtain happiness now here's where it kind of gets tricky because the world the world isn't lying when it says you know do this and you'll be happy the world's actually telling the truth because when you sin, it makes you happy. It makes your flesh happy. But what God is, what Jesus is saying, he's subverting those expectations and saying, actually the world is, well, he's not saying that the world is telling the truth, but he is saying that if you want real happiness, real satisfaction, here's how you get it in your daily life. And so the Beatitudes are exactly that. It's a way to change your attitudes, uh, to change your perception of uh, reality to change your perception of the world and your surroundings and really there are practical ways to uh, get you on the right path to view the world in a way where you can go through the struggles go through the trials and come out of it with joy with satisfaction and the world tells you the opposite it tells you don't feel discomfort don't feel guilt don't feel shame 
even with all this, uh, you know, LGBT stuff, right? Pride Month, they say celebrate who you are, celebrate your sinfulness. You know, the Bible actually tells the exact opposite. It actually says hate your sin, kill your sin, kill your flesh. And so total opposition to what the world teaches. So in order to kill sin, you have to go through discomfort. In order to kill your flesh, you have to be joyful about the, dis the present discomfort that you're in. This also uh, is also very closely, this is also very closely related to the process of sanctification. When God is uh, transforming your life, he is uh, refining you through the fires, you know, in scriptures, in scriptures, sanctification is likened to the process of purifying gold. So that's exactly what God is doing with his people. That is why uh, that is why we face trials. That's why Christians face trials. And not just trials that are outwardly, but also inwardly. That's why we struggle with ourselves. We struggle with those around us. We struggle with the bigger things at play here in the world. But uh, above all, those things should bring us joy because it is a sign that God is with us. Because if we weren't being tested, if we weren't struggling, that would means that we're al that means that we're alone, and that's the worst thing you can be is uh, alone apart from God. But if you are being tested and you know that you are being sanctified and being transformed, you know that God is with you and that uh, He won't abandon you in this time of struggle. But you still have to look at it as a way to be joyful. Because that should be the proper response to present discomfort. Because it is a sign that you will receive the future everlasting comfort. So, all that. I uh, hope all that made sense. That's just the introduction to the Beatitudes. That's basically everything that I had prepared for this episode for the introduction. In the next episode, I'll begin going through each Beatitude. One episode on each Beatitude. So please subscribe uh, on YouTube. Subscribe on Rumble. I'm also on Spotify. And uh, the new name, the new name for the podcast is Sober Minded with Mark the Mimic. So look that up on Spotify. I had to change the name because Spotify made some kind of update with their podcast uh, uploading thing. So I had to make a new account. I couldn't access my older accounts. So uh, that's the new name to follow me on Spotify. So follow me on there. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. And I hope you look forward to the following episodes that will be coming out. And there's going to be some more changes to the way that I do the podcast. And I'm hoping it will work out. Uh, yeah, and you'll see what I'm talking about in the next episode. But that's it for this episode. Let me know your thoughts and your questions. And I'll see you in the next one. I am not nice, I am not kind, and I am not wonderful.